I don't know about you, but I like that beat. Feels a little bit like summer, right? Hey, well, listen, we're so glad that you guys are here, whether you're joining us here or at our 211 uh, campus. We are wrapping up a series uh, called Replenish. And if you're just joining us for the first time and you're thinking, I didn't even know we were in a series, uh, that's okay. Uh, you can go online, check it out at Bethlehem Church. Uh, we would love for you to kind of catch up uh, with what God has done throughout this series. And I pray uh, that God uses it in your life. I've had some incredible conversations uh, with people. And really, I've said all along that this series is born out of my own personal experience over the past year and a half just with the uh, speed of culture, the speed of life. And the reason why we call it replenish is not uh, so much from the physical standpoint, but more importantly, the spiritual standpoint, that, that we have to replenish our souls because our, our souls are the most vital thing that we have. In fact, you may even believe that you have a soul in here, uh, but you probably struggle defining what your soul is. And we've kind of given a consistent definition to the word soul, and here's what we've said, and this is in your notes. Uh, the soul is the operating system of your life. Again, it's the most vital thing, possession that you have, so you better pay attention to it. Because the speed of culture and the speed of life, I will take it to this extent, is assault, assaulting our souls. And we feel this. Just the speed of culture, the speed of life, what this is doing to our souls. In fact, if we had to put a, a name to it, a definition to what it's doing to our soul, here's the word that I would use. Anxiety. Anxiety. And for many of us in this room, I, I see you getting a little bit anxious and a little bit restless just seeing the word anxiety. Because every single person in this room struggles at some level or another with anxiety. We all deal uh, with anxiety. And, and let me put a definition to, uh, to what I feel anxiety is, okay? This is my own personal definition, okay? Not going to find this in Webster, uh, although he might want to use it. But here it is. Anxiety is a present emotion of inner unrest, restlessness, produced by the fear of future events. It's an inner unrest that, that fears the future. Now, oftentimes, we might say that, that we struggle with fear and anxiety. But the truth is, fear and anxiety are two different things. And I want to highlight that because that's important. And we're going to focus more on anxiety than we are on fear. But, but here, here's what I would say about fear and anxiety right here. Fear and anxiety are not the same. They are siblings, but not twins. They're siblings, they're similar, but they're not twins. In fact, fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines a threat. The fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines a threat. And that's important because all of us feel anxious at times of what could happen in our lives. In fact, Statistically speaking, when we talk about anxiety, there, there's some interesting things that we deal with in, in our society. First of all, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in America. 19.1 million adults, and listen, that's just ages 18 to 54, struggle with anxiety. Teenage anxiety is at an all-time record high. Listen to this, $300 billion dollars a year is spent on stress-related disorders. $300 billion a year. The U.S. is now the most anxious nation in the world. The most anxious nation in the world. We are three times more anxious than the previous generation. Now, what's interesting to me about this is that when you think about this, our cars are safer than ever, right? Travel is safer. Food and water are safer. We don't have to worry about the things that a lot of people around the world have to worry about. Our economy is good. We're not fighting wars in our backyard. And yet, anxiousness and anxiety is on the rise. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. We're going to spend some time on this. But, but before we get there, if the soul is the operating system of our lives, anxiety 
is a virus that infiltrates it. So if soul is the operating system of our lives, then I think that anxiety is, is a virus that infiltrates that operating system. And what does a virus do to our computers? It slows things down. It robs it of energy. Things just don't quite run the way that they should run. And I think that's what anxiety does to you and I. It kind of runs in the background of our lives. It zaps us of power, energy, makes us feel depressed, insecure, and things just don't quite work the way that they should. I think one of the reasons why this is true is because, and we said this in week two, our minds are always in the on position. Our brains are always in the on position. Just the speed of information the things that we deal with in this generation that previous generations didn't have to deal with. Think about this. Previous generations, dating back 30 years or more, previous generations, when the sun went down, for the most part, the information stopped. That's not true anymore. Now we have an onslaught of information that we get 24-7. In fact, it used to be in society there were what are called stopping cues, there were moments when we would naturally, just the rhythm of life, where we would be able to stop, reset, and rest. Not just from a physical standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint, a soul level as well. But those are quickly being removed from our society. Just think about information, news information. We get it at an unprecedented rate. We used to get it in our driveways, for those of you who remember that. When people would actually go around and throw a newspaper in your driveway and you'd wake up, you have your morning coffee and your breakfast and you get the newspaper out, what do you do? You look at the information, things that may have happened around the globe or locally or in our nation. But nowadays, we get that information almost instantaneously. We get it in our phones, we get it on our watches. We get that information and listen, our lives are lived in the on position. And it's very difficult to process the amount of information that we're getting in our brains. Think about social media for a second. Social media is really a bottomless pit. It never stops. Some of you have tried to find the bottom of Facebook, right? You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, but you can't get to the bottom of it. Not only that, the internet is designed for you to chase rabbits for one set of little bit of information to lead to another and another, and another, and another. Before long, you look at your watch, or you look at, and you're thinking, I spent 30 minutes, I spent an hour on this? Because the more clicks, more advertisement, more money, and it's designed to capture your attention. One last example is TV. It used to be that we would watch a TV show, and then it would go off, and a week later, what would we have to do? We'd have to wait for it, and then it would come back on. Nowadays, with Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime, we can literally binge whole seasons of shows. That information, we don't have to stop. And I don't think that our brains know how to shut it down. And I think it's leading to anxiety and anxiousness in our souls. But here's the good news. What we said last week is that it's not the quality of your life that determines the health of your soul. It's the quality of your soul that determines the health of your life. And even though culture probably isn't going to change, you and I, from an inner perspective, can change. In other words, our inner world can be healthy and it can slow down our outer world. One of my favorite authors, Max Licato, said this about anxiety, and I love this. He says, the presence of anxiety might be unavoidable in our culture, just the amount of information that we get, but the prison of anxiety... That's optional. And over and over in Scripture, what do we see? We see Jesus. We see Peter. We see Paul. We see others look at us and say, don't be anxious. In fact, Jesus, in the greatest sermon ever delivered, the Sermon on the Mount, he looked at the people who were watching, and he spoke to us as well, and he said, don't be anxious with your life. Don't live a life of anxiousness. But here's the question, how do we do that? I mean, how do we live a life where we are not 
anxious, where anxiety is not constantly creeping in or living in the background, operating the background of our lives. I mean, think about this. Could you imagine if I said, we're going to talk about anxiety today, and I, and I got up and I said, hey, here's what Scripture says. Scripture says, don't be anxious. So in other words, if, if, you, wanna, if you, you don't want to be anxious anymore, here's what you need to do. Stop. Stop being anxious. Right? I mean, if we don't want to be anxious anymore, we don't li- want to live a life of anxiety, then we just simply need to stop. If I would stand up here and say that and then go, okay, let's pray, you would be thinking, when's the real preacher coming back, right? I know Jason's coming back in a week or so. When's he coming back? You see, the truth is, many of us would love to stop, but we struggle stopping. And I'm going to take it one level deeper. For many of us in here, anxiety is at a clinical level. And we battle with anxiety disorder. And you want to stop, but you struggle to do that. Well, this week, we had the privilege to sit down with a friend of mine. His name's Johnny Pence. And he has struggled his whole life with anxiety disorder. And so we sat down with Johnny, and we asked him to share his struggles with us, what he's learned in life, and more importantly, what God is doing in him. And here's what he said. Um, My name's Johnny, and one of the biggest battles I've faced in my life is anxiety. I can remember anxiety going back all the way to when I was childhood. I remember being in a grocery store with my mom and worrying about if she had enough money to pay for the groceries. I would refuse getting a candy bar because I was scared we didn't have enough money to pay for it. So it's been something I dealt with my entire life. You live in fear a lot, and I get emotional about this, I'm sorry, but it's ridiculous for a grown man to be afraid to me or the way the world looks at a man, how a man should be, but um, it's a real thing, and it's very lonely because nobody really understands it. If uh, you've never dealt with it, you can't really, you can't put fingers to people. Like, well, just, because mine always dealt with health issues. Like, I've been to the hospital four times thinking I had a heart attack, and it was just my anxiety. Well, they diagnosed me with panic disorder, which even to an anxious person, it makes you more anxious. It's like a, a never-ending circle. It just goes on and on and on. There's, you shouldn't fear when you serve a mighty God that we have, um, it's almost, you almost feel ashamed because you do feel that way. But that doesn't matter, he loves you anyway. I mean, anxiety is terrible and it's rough, but um, through God and knowing what he's done for me and being thankful for all he's done for me, uh, it doesn't make it necessarily easier but it, it makes you where you can function. Because it's a very, I mean, being anxious is debilitating, it really is. And if you've never experienced yourself, you just can't understand it. And I wish, I cannot put into words what it's like. A verse that I cling to, it's Philippians 4, 6. And nothing be anxious, put in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. So I never was able to deal with my anxiety any other way than until I realized I needed to put my focus elsewhere, which was on um, thankfulness to Jesus um, for what he's done for us. No matter what level of anxiety you have, you could be down at a, to where it's just worry, all the way up to a clinical anxiety like I have. Um, you can be delivered from that, because I have. But it's still a daily grind. It's not like it's something that's been wiped clean. It's just the focus is, my focus has changed. On, uh, instead of focusing on how I felt or little uh, twinges in my body or something, this could be something terrible. It's like, oh, it's gotta be cancer. It's the worst possible thing. So that's gotta be what it is. I put my focus on Jesus and being thankful for it what he's done for me because he's given me so much more than I deserve. Let's give it up for Johnny. 
For those of you who are in this room, you saw Johnny up here leading worship. Uh, those of you over at 211, he leads uh, over there um, a lot. And I'll tell you, man, what God is doing in his life and, and such truth that he spoke uh, and really from a vulnerable place that it really speaks to a lot of us. And I believe that God can give us, no matter where we struggle with anxiety, whether it be on a clinical stand, side or whether it be from worry, I believe that God can bring victory to our lives. And I'm not going to say that we're going to go as far to say by the end of this talk that, that none of us are going to feel anxious anymore, but here's what I hope. I hope that it's a, it's a conversation that begins and that God begins to give you a freedom in this. And if you're in here and you say, you know what, I struggle, I struggle for, with anxiety from a medical standpoint, then listen, listen to what I'm about to say. That might be necessary in your life. I don't want to dismiss this. But also, don't forget that the ultimate cure for humanity is the grace of Jesus Christ. He is the one who frees us. And just what Johnny said, that might be a daily thing for you, but I believe that God can give us victory in that. And medication may get you to a place where you can experience the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. But I want to look at two passages uh, today by two different men. And one of those men uh, is by the name of Peter, and the other is named Paul. In fact, Johnny mentioned uh, in Philippians chapter 4, if you got your Bibles, we're going to spend some time there, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. Uh, we're going to look at a passage where Paul gets incredibly practical about anxiousness and anxiety with us. And if you're in here and you're, uh, you're a Kindle user, something interesting about this passage, the, the Bible is the most downloaded book on Kindle. And this passage, Philippians 4, 6 through 8, is the most highlighted passage in all of Kindle, all books. So that might say something about our society. But here's what Paul says. He says, don't be anxious about anything. To which, again, we say, okay, that sounds really good. How do I do that? Well, he gets incredibly practical. Here's what he says. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we're going to come back to that, present your request to God. Prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, I believe that Paul gives us two prescriptions for anxiety. And here's the first. I want you to write this down. The first prescription for anxiousness is thankfulness. It's thankfulness. You see, if anxiety is a virus that, that infiltrates our souls, then I think that, that thankfulness is a prescription to that anxiety. It really refocuses our attention on what our lives should be on. And in moments when anxiety sets in, it's important that we refocus our attention because oftentimes we are prone to the worst case example. What could happen in our lives? But here's what Paul says when anxiousness starts to rise in your life. He says in the preceding passages, rejoice in the Lord always. When do we rejoice in the Lord? Always. And he says it again. I will say it again in case you missed it. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in everything. Now, why would Paul say this? There's a, there's a powerful reason why he would say this. Because thankfulness and anxiousness can't occupy the same space. Clinically speaking, you cannot be anxious and thankful at the same time. Use two different parts of your brain. So when you choose to be thankful, you're choosing to focus on the faithfulness of God and what he's done in your life. And listen, it's a choice. Just like Johnny said, you gotta wake up every day and you gotta choose to be thankful, to rejoice in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And this is important because when we rejoice, it causes us to remember don't miss this. That's incredibly important when we talk about anxiety and anxiousness. Because here's what anxiety and anxious do, anxiousness does. It causes us to forget. When we struggle with anxiousness and anxiety, it causes us to forget the faithfulness of God. And over and over in Scripture, we see examples of men and women, even Jesus' closest followers, his disciples, whole tribes who forgot the faithfulness of God. One of the most striking examples to me in all of Scripture is found in the book of Exodus. Some of you may be familiar 
uh, with God's chosen people known as the Israelites. If you didn't grow up in church, then you probably heard about it. Maybe you saw a movie on the Exodus. You see, the Israelites were in bondage by a Pharaoh, an evil Pharaoh. They were in slavery. And yet Jesus used a man by the name of God, Jesus, used a man by the name of Moses in order to get them out of slavery, out of bondage. He used 10 incredible plagues. You can go read it in the Exodus account. He used 10 incredible plagues. And finally, Pharaoh had enough, and he released God's people, the Israelites. And so as they were leaving, Pharaoh decided, no, 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 I'm not going to allow them to, to leave. And so he began to chase them with his army. And then they got to a sea, the Red Sea. And as they're at the Red Sea, you got to think, literally thousands, maybe a million people, plus people, were standing at the edge of the sea. What do you do next? And here's what, here's what God did through Moses. Moses parted the Red Sea. And so he parted it, and the Israelites walked across on dry land to get to the destination, the promised land that he had promised them. Not only that, he gave them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them and guide them. Now imagine if you are the Israelites and you experience that and experience the faithfulness of God. You would think that would change your life forever, but here's the problem. 15 days later, 15 days later, they forgot. And you know why they forgot? Because they got anxious. They didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. And you would think they would go, hey, listen, the same God who parted the Red Sea surely can provide my next meal for them. But they didn't. And here's what they did in their anxiousness. We find this in Exodus. Here's what they say. If only we would have died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. You see, anxiousness causes us to forget. Again, we see this in Jesus' closest disciples. When Jesus is preaching, and Scripture says that over 4,000 people had gathered to hear Jesus preach, but there was a problem. They didn't have any food. And so the disciples walked around and realized that they had no answer for this, and so they went to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, we need to send them away. We don't have any food to feed them. And Jesus looks at them and says, why don't you feed them? And they looked at Jesus and said, that's going to be a problem. We, we can't do that. I, I, you heard us say, we don't have any food. Now, the problem is the disciples forgot the faithfulness of God. Because if they would have remembered the faithfulness of God, they would remember that only weeks earlier there was a crowd, crowd even larger of 5,000 or more. And Jesus did a miracle when he took a few loaves of bread and a few fish and he multiplied them and he fed a crowd and even had leftovers. But the problem is they forgot. That anxiousness set in in their lives and they forgot. You see... The reality is the same creator who was faithful in the past was the same creator who would have been faithful in the present. But anxiety causes us to forget. But Paul gives us a second prescription. The second prescription for anxiousness is prayerfulness. It's prayerfulness. Now this is a big one because we all like to feel in control. In fact, I say it this way, perceived control creates calm. A lack of control gives birth to fear. But watch this. As anxiety increases, perceived control decreases. And then we try to do everything that we can to control our world. Because you and I, all, all of us, we like certainty. But here's the only certainty in life. The only certainty of life is that there is no certainty. You and I are not in control of anything on our own. You and I can't control anything. The only certainty is found in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's not in our control. We, in reality, can't control anything. Some of us know this because we're parents. And you try to control your kids but you can't control your kids. Some of you are trying to control your spouse, but you're realizing how difficult that is because we can't even control ourselves most of the time, much less our spouses. Or what about the economy? For those of you who struggle and think, I, I gotta control my finances. Think about how absurd that is. Imagine how, just how big the economy is to think that somehow we can control that. 
The reality is we are powerless. We are not in control of anything. We can't control what is going to happen to us because there is some uncertainty in life. And when we try to control our lives, when anxiety begins to, to rise and we, we try to control our lives, here's what happens. We fall into a cycle. And that cycle is really control followed by failure, followed by control, followed by failure. And you know what happens to anxiety? It rises in our lives. And that's what many of us feel because we're trying to control everything, but we cannot. And here's what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that instead of trying to control it, we have to relinquish it. You see, here's what prayer does. Prayer acknowledges that we are not in control. Prayer acknowledges that you and I are not in control. The creator and sov the sovereign creator of the universe is in control. We are not in control. And rather than rehearsing, listen, rather than rehearsing the chaos of our world and our lives, what scripture says is to rejoice in the sovereign creator of the universe. That when we are not in control, the good news is there is someone who is in control. And here's what Paul says about him. He says, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That the Lord is near. And as our anxiety, our anxiety decreases, Bethlehem, when our understanding of God's sovereignty increases. If you want to see anxiety decrease in your life, it's when your understanding of God's sovereignty increases. But we all deal with chaos, right? You can't escape it. One of my mentors said one time, I thought it was the, probably the most interesting advice that I've ever gotten. He said, Matt, when, when things get a little chaotic around you and, and chaos really sets in and you, you feel out of control, he goes, do you know what the best thing you can do? And I said, no, I don't. He said, the best thing you can do is take a nap. And I thought to myself, I like naps, but that might be the worst advice that I've ever heard in my entire life. It sounds good, right? Just go take a nap. But thankfully, he explained, he said, here's what a nap is. A nap is a non-anxious presence. You see, the greatest thing that you give as a leader when a situation is chaotic, whether at work or at your home, is a non-anxious presence. It's the greatest gift you can give to a moment of chaos, is to live your life with a non-anxious presence. Think about this. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt anxiety beginning to rise? You felt anxiousness in your soul, and you felt that emotion, that fear, and all that stuff start rising up in you. And then you do something that we have all done. You pass the pressure, the emotion, and the anxiety onto others. It's, instead of dealing with it in a proper way, we pass the pressure of anxiety and emotion onto other people. We do this as men sometimes. I know I've done it before. I mean, you think about after a long day's work and you're tired and you've dealt with coworkers and people all day and you're just, you're just exhausted. And when you get home, there, there is a tendency to pass that pressure onto others, to walk into the door and pass the pressure onto our spouse or pass the pressure onto our kids. There, I'll say it the other way. There's even a tendency sometimes as a mom, especially those of you who are stay-at-home moms, I know you've got the most difficult job in the world. It's tough to raise children. Some of you do it as a working parent as well, a single parent. I can't even imagine. But you think about it, maybe your husband comes in the door and you've had a long day with the kids and the first thing you do is you pass the anxiety, you pass the pressure onto them. And they walk into the door and it's like, whoa, what just happened? Where did this come from? See, we all have this tendency to pass the weight, to pass the pressure onto others. And here's the problem. 
The problem is we cast our anxiety onto people who cannot bear the weight. It's the reason why Peter says in chapter 5, verse 7, he says, here's what we are called to do, to cast all of our anxiety on him, him being Jesus, because he cares for you. You see, there's only one person who can carry the weight of your anxiety. The only person who can carry the weight is Jesus. He is the only person who can carry that weight. You can't carry that weight. Other people can't fully carry that weight. The only person who can carry that weight is Jesus. And listen, when we cast it off on him, we are admitting our inability and we're trusting in his sovereignty. We're admitting, hey, I can't handle this. I've tried to control it, and I cannot control it. But I'm going to pass it, I'm going to cast it off onto someone who can. And here's what Peter says. He says, humble yourself. Cast it off. Admit that you can't handle it. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Now watch this. Consistently in Scripture, we see that God opposes the proud. And you know what pride says? Pride says that we can handle it. Pride says that we can carry this. But here's what humility says. We can't handle it. We can't carry it. And we cast it off onto the person who can carry it. But here's the kicker. The kicker is in due time. You see, some of us struggle with in due time. In fact, I think it's part of it's just the nature of our society as we've been talking about the speed of life. That we're trying to cast our anxiety off, but, but we're thinking, we're struggling with what in due time looks like because we still feel anxious. One of my uh, favorite authors, Levi Lesko, says we probably shouldn't be the ones who determine what in due time looks like. He goes on, he says, we're the same people that burn our mouths on Hot Pockets. <laughs> I thought that's so good, right? I mean, what is a Hot Pocket? You take it out of the wrapper, you put it in the microwave, two minutes later, two, two minutes later you have a meal. And we can't even wait for it to cool down, right? Because we don't do well with in due time. We get anxious. We feel like God should deliver us immediately, and there's certain things that we have to come back to daily. And ultimately, listen, God will begin to deliver you, just like Johnny said in that testimony, but it may be in due time. And let me tell you what this looks like. This looks like you casting daily your anxiety and your anxiousness on to Jesus. And it means you get up early in the morning, and when you spend time with the Lord, Here's what you say, God, I'm prone to anxiousness today. And God, looking over my schedule, there, there are things that I know that I'm, I feel anxiety beginning to rise. There's a meeting that I have coming up. And God, I know I'm prone to anxiousness, God, and I want to make a conscious decision to cast that anxiety on you. Or maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe you're waiting on a test result or you don't know how the situation's going to turn out and you know you're prone to go to the worst case scenario in your mind. But today you choose to cast that anxiety onto the person who can handle it. Because he is the only person rated to carry the weight of your anxiety. A couple months ago, we, uh, we moved into a new house. After about seven months of waiting, and we were anxious to get, I say anxious, we were anxious to get into the house. And we got into the house, uh, I knew what was coming. There's certain things you have to do in a new house. You gotta hang things on the wall, right? You gotta hang pictures, you gotta hang shelves. And, and I even had to hang a TV on the wall. And, and I knew when I'm hanging that TV on the wall, I knew I better get anchors strong enough to, to carry, to bear the weight. And so I went to Home Depot to make sure that I got anchors that, that, could bear, that, could, that could bear the weight. And the reason why you had to do that, because if you don't, at some point, that TV is going to come crashing down. I think anxiety is the same thing. 
If you don't cast the weight onto someone who is rated to carry it, if you don't do that, at some point, your life is going to come crashing down. And the only person rated to carry that is the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he beat death, hell, and the grave. He carried the weight of your sin, your anxiety, your emotions, and your fear on the cross. And if you can beat death, then you can carry the anxiety of humanity. He has already proven that he can do so. And here's what he's saying to all of us in this room. Daily, cast your anxiety. Humble yourself. Cast your anxiety on me. And listen, I will lift you up. I will give you victory. It may be in due time, but you will have victory. And that's the picture for us. And I want to leave you with something. This is the way Paul closes this, and I love what he says here. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then I love this, and watch this. And the peace, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, there is a peace that transcends all understanding when we cast our anxiety, our anxiousness on the person ready to carry it. He's the only person who can. And here's what Jesus promises us, that he will give us a peace that passes all understanding. And I believe that can happen for every single person here at 211 watching online. It may be a daily thing, but I believe that God can give you victory. He can carry the weight. I want to close this series out with a picture. It's really a story that's found in in the fourth chapter of Mark. In fact, one of my favorite stories in all scripture, in one of my favorite books in scripture. And Jesus and his disciples were, were leaving the crowds, which Jesus often did, as we said. And they were in a boat, and they were crossing over the Sea of Galilee. And as many of you know, these are seasoned fishermen. They're used to boats, they're used to water, they feel comfortable in it. But something happened when they were in the middle of this this sea. A storm came up. And it was a formidable storm. In fact, it was a storm that was larger than probably they had maybe ever seen. And the problem is, their boat wasn't rated to bear the weight of that storm. The storm was too much for their boat. And so they did everything they could to try to remedy the situation. And I can imagine, here's what they're doing. They're grabbing buckets. They're grabbing whatever they can, and they're trying to bail the water out of the boat to save the boat and themselves, but to no avail. And they knew that the situation was dire, that they couldn't fix the situation, and then a light bulb went off and they looked around and they thought, where's Jesus? And you know where Jesus was? Scripture says that he was in the stern of the boat and he was taking a nap. A non-anxious presence. You see, the reason why Jesus wasn't anxious is because the wind and the waves know his name. And when they casted their anxiety, their fear onto Jesus, you know what he did? He stood up, which is not something you usually do in a boat that size in a storm that big. But he stood up and he says, peace, be still. And calm went across the water. And the disciples looked at each other and they said, who is this guy? That even the wind and the waves know who he is let me tell you who he is he's the only person who can carry your anxiety because your soul was created to be connected to your creator to be yoked to your creator and if you were here in the first week we said that our souls are like buckets and we try to fill that 
that void, we try to fill our soul with a lot of things, but the problem is, is that we try to fill it with creation when our souls were created to be connected to our creator. And for some of us in here, listen, we're trying to fix the anxious, anxiety of situations, and like the disciples, we're trying to bail out the water, and you're realizing that you are sinking today. But the good news is there is someone who is in the boat with you who can calm the waters of your life. The only one who is rated to bear the weight of your soul. And here's what he says. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me bear the weight. Let me carry your anxiety and your anxiousness. Cast it on me because I can handle it.